Good morning, I'm Vicki Wynn. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, new warning. Could the Delta variant be even more contagious than we thought? The Washington Post has obtained an internal CDC document that says preliminary data shows the Delta variant of COVID-19 spreads like chicken pox, even if you're fully vaccinated. Plus, indoor mask requirements going back into effect this weekend and the White House rolling out new vaccine mandates. Do these new rules impact you? Olympic stunner, American gymnast Suni Lee won the all around gold, stepping up to the plate with Simone Biles out of the competition. Plus another big day for Team USA in the pool and a little bit of controversy. Also a scary crash for defending BMX gold medalist Connor Fields, the latest from Tokyo. Severe storms, tornadoes ripped through Pennsylvania and New Jersey as dangerous weather passed through the East Coast. In its path, a trail of destruction, cars, businesses, and homes destroyed. We're tracking the weather for your weekend. And preparing for takeoff, I got an exclusive inside look at an air traffic control tower in the busiest airspace in the world, just as the FAA kicks off a major hiring campaign. Looking for a new generation of air traffic controllers, and their ideal candidate may surprise you. So fascinating, that piece. I got a chance to look at it. And really, what an interesting concept. You don't think that air traffic control resembles video, video games. games. There's a tease. Yes. Yeah, I know. It really was quite interesting to see. And it actually makes a lot of sense. Once totally. You get into it. Yeah, Absolutely. So we'll bring you that good story. later in this hour. We'll start, though, with the White House stepping up its push to get more Americans vaccinated, now requiring federal workers to get the shot or face restrictions and offering new incentives if you do so. It comes as the Delta variant causes daily new case numbers to reach levels we haven't seen in months. More than 102,000 Americans have tested positive in just the past day. President Biden repeating the message that this is now a pandemic of the unvaccinated. This is American tragedy. People are dying and will die who don't have to die. If you're out there unvaccinated, you don't have to die. Look, this is not about red states and blue states. It's literally about life and death. It's about life and death. That's what it's about. The wave of vaccine mandates comes as leaders across the country face a tough question. Should mask mandates come back? Well, that's now the case in the nation's capital. And that is where we find NBC News correspondent Heidi Presbella. Heidi, good morning. So new indoor mask mandate goes into effect tomorrow, back into effect. What's behind this decision to follow the CDC guidance and mask up? Well, good morning, ladies. We are in new waters of the pandemic, and there are potentially even more confusing waters to navigate. D.C. is actually doing pretty well when it comes to vaccinations. About 72 percent of the population here has had at least one shot. There's no problem really at hospitals. Hospitalizations are down, and yet the relative number of cases has quadrupled just over the past couple of weeks. And that is why the mayor here made the call. Here's what she had to say. I know that D.C. residents have been very closely following the public health guidelines, uh, and uh, they will embrace this. Uh, our businesses will embrace it, and we will continue to do what is necessary to keep D.C. safe. We want to be clear, um, and businesses can deny you service for not following their rules and, and our rules. Now, she said that this is an attempt to avoid even more draconian measures, such as lockdowns that we've seen in the past, capacity limits. However, just over the river in Northern Virginia, where we've seen even more spread in some local communities, the Democratic governor there, Governor Northam, has said, we're not doing that right now. So this is the new world that we're living in here, which is a patchwork. A new world with the same old confusion and mixed up mandates everywhere. And I know that that leads to a lot of criticism as D.C.'s mayor is already facing over the new mandate. Tell us what you're hearing. You can see it. You can see it on the streets. You can see it in Congress, just less than a mile from here, where you had Democratic and Republican members seeing tensions with Republicans marching from one side of the Capitol to the other without masks in protest. We're starting to see that as well. You can see it in your Twitter feed. And the real question here is the same that we're going to face in cities and states around the country, which is who is going to enforce this? 
There is no mask police. Uh, what we've seen in the past is that it is really the Department of Health. Are we going to have people calling uh, the health department on their neighbors? Really, it comes down to businesses. Businesses will have to enforce it, and they will have to tell people, similar to those signs that we all grew up with on the door, no shoes, no service, no mask, no service. So many things that businesses are going to have to deal with. Also with vaccine mandates, we just heard Danny Meyer come out, big restaurateur yesterday, say you're going to have to have a vaccine and we're going to enforce it just like we would if you're not 21, if you can drink alcohol or not. It's going to be interesting to see, and I'm sure not without controversy. Heidi, where else are we seeing mask mandates? How are some other major cities reacting to the CDC guidance and the rising cases? Right, Savannah. So here, here's where we're headed. In New York City, the mayor there has said that he is not taking any steps yet. However, he teased that early next week, citizens there could expect some new guidance. In Atlanta, the mayor has issued an order similar to here, but there the governor disagrees. So who wins if it comes to blows? Well, we can see what's happening if you move along to Kansas City, where the same thing is happening, where the mayor issued an order, but the attorney general has already dropped a lawsuit on that mayor. And guys, it's hard to not look through the looking glass here and see that in the future, once the vaccine <clears throat> is fully approved, that you're going to see cities and states, businesses all moving towards mm. some kind of vaccine mandate. All guys, right, Heidi, thank you so much. Israel is now offering more people a third dose of the coronavirus vaccine. It's part of an aggressive campaign that could lead the way for the rest of the world. NBC News global correspondent Raf Sanchez joins us now with more. Good morning, Raf. Starting today, Israelis 60 and over will be eligible for that booster shot of the Pfizer vaccine. So talk to us more about this new, it really is a first of its kind effort. Vicky, good morning. That's exactly right. Israel has led the world at so many stages during this pandemic. Earlier this year, it had the fastest mass vaccination campaign in the world. A few weeks ago, it became the first country to start giving a booster dose to people with weakened immune systems. And this morning, the first country in the world to offer that third dose to everybody over 60. The very first person to get that shot this morning was Israeli President Isaac Herzog. He is 60 years old. He just qualified. He was joined at the vaccination center by Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett, who made the decision yesterday to move ahead with this new vaccination campaign. Take a listen to what the Prime Minister had to say about the reasoning behind that decision. The decision was based on considerable research and analysis, as well as the rise in risk of the Delta variant wave. Israel has already vaccinated 2,000 immunosuppressed people with a third dose with no severe adverse events. And now we're rolling out a national third dose campaign. Now, the prime minister went on to say it is older people who are getting the vaccination, but younger people have a role to play here. He told younger Israelis, call your parents, call your grandparents and make sure they are going out and getting that booster shot. Vicky. Raf, it, obviously this is in part because people who were 60 and above probably got their shots a lot earlier and perhaps that immunity is waning, which is why they're offering that third dose. Can we talk a little bit about vaccine inequality, though? What does this do for struggling countries who haven't even gotten their first and second doses yet? Yeah, this is a major concern for poorer countries of the world. As you said, there are many places that have struggled to even get a first dose. And now wealthier countries like Israel, like the U.S., starting to think about moving towards third doses. Doctors Without Borders put out a statement earlier this week saying this is not acceptable. We cannot have a situation where some countries have three doses and some have none. Vicky, they say there is a moral but also a practical argument here mm -hmm. because wealthy countries of the world can get themselves fully vaccinated. They can get boosters on top of that. But if poorer countries are not able to get vaccines, we are going to continue to see mutations. We are going to continue to see new variants. And Vicky, that will threaten everybody. Very good point, Raf. Thank you. And we should note the World Health Organization is not recommending a third dose of the COVID vaccine. Raf, thanks so much.
That's exactly where we'll pick it up with Dr. Ali Raja. He's the executive vice chair of the emergency medicine department at Massachusetts General Hospital, also the co-founder of Get Us PPE. Dr. Raja, as Vicky just very smartly mentioned, we are not seeing this recommendation for booster shots coming from any of the world's major health organizations or the CDC here in the U.S. So what does this mean for the U.S. as we do see a country roll out a third shot? Savannah, it's really interesting. I think most people are still waiting for some more data, but I've got to say the data that Raf just talked about and the data that I've been reviewing coming out of Israel over the past few weeks shows that immunity does wane and we are likely going to need boosters here in the U.S. as well. We know this and most vaccines need boosters and we've been planning for this potentiality for months. What we need to do now is start thinking about re-engaging the infrastructure we built in for the first vaccinations and, and start thinking about potentially getting boosters in health clinics and pharmacies and mobile vaccination sites and maybe even mass vaccination sites. Mm -hmm. But what I was going to emphasize, and I think that Raf did a good job of covering this, is we need to make sure that poorer countries get vaccines for the first dose as well. We're responding Delta variant right now, but there are other variants that are going to develop in other countries if we don't get vaccines to the entire world. Yeah, absolutely. It's something to certainly watch, especially as this conversation sort of intensifies this hype around a booster shot when, to keep in mind, we get the flu shot every year. So it's just answers I think a lot of people are waiting for. I also now want to ask you about something that we mentioned at the top of the show, an internal CDC report first obtained by the Washington Post, not yet confirmed by NBC News, I'll note. It says, though, the Delta variant of the coronavirus appears to cause more severe illness than earlier variants and spreads as easily as chicken pox. And it argues that officials must, quote, acknowledge the war has changed. What does this tell you about the severity of the Delta variant? And does this kind of shed any new light for you on how our U.S. government organizations are approaching this virus and where we're currently at? It, it does. Uh, Sven, I read that report <clears throat> yet last night in a lot of detail. And the fact is that I think it confirms what a lot of us have been saying, that that the Delta variant is more contagious. Now, they compare it to other viruses. Um, it's more contagious than viruses that caused Ebola and SARS and the flu. Not that it's more severe than things like Ebola, but it's more contagious. What it does also show in that report is that the Delta variant actually does cause more severe disease than the original COVID strain. And, and I think we've been seeing that, especially with unvaccinated patients mm -hmm. who have been, in, been getting it. It also shows that there's higher rates of hospitalization with the Delta variant in other countries like Canada and Singapore and even in the U.S. But it does have some reassuring data and it shows that the vaccines are working and they're still about 90 percent effective even against the Delta variant in preventing severe disease. Dr. Ali Raja, so much to unpack. Thank you for helping us walk through it all. Good to see you. Now we turn to Tokyo, where Team USA is celebrating some big wins this morning, including, of course, mm -hmm. Suni Lee, who won gold. <laughs> we watched it live yesterday morning in the gymnastics all around. We've also seen a silver medal swimmer claim some competitors may have been cheating, and track and field is getting underway. To cover all that and any other Olympic news we need to hear, NBC News correspondent Stephanie Goss joins us now live from Tokyo. Stephanie, good morning. So, of course, we've got to start with Suni Lee. I mean, she was winning gold just as we were wrapping up here yesterday. We were like silently <laughs> cheering and stuff as we as our show is just headed off the air. But she stepped up when Simone Biles stepped back in the women's gymnastics all around. So tell us, when can we see the superstar next? I know people are just obsessed with her as we are right now. When are we going to see her next? And could we see her compete alongside Simone Biles in upcoming events since we don't know yet if we'll see Simone again? There's a chance. Yeah. First, let me say, Savannah, that I was not silently cheering. <laughs> I, I was bet. actually very loudly <laughs> cheering <laughs> while you were silently cheering. And I was with a big group of other people here from NBC News who were doing exactly the same thing. You know, she she came into that event and she had been all along thinking she was going for silver. Suddenly, this opportunity opens up for her <laughs> all that pressure on her, all of the eyes of the world on her. And what does she do? She pulls it out. Mm -hmm. She pulls it out and wins the gold medal <laughs> in fantastic fashion. There was just such a sense of joy in that arena. Also quite a bit of relief, I think, for people that who were there. You know, we will see her again. Uh, we don't know whether we're going to see her alongside Simone Biles. Mm. She's definitely qualified for the uneven bars where she's the favorite for the gold and also the beam. You know, you're looking at pictures of her family. <laughs> These watch parties, I have to say, are probably they get the gold medal for the Olympics. Yes. They're so amazing because normally you see a couple of 
parents, maybe some friends in the stands. But the watch parties, it's everybody. Mm -hmm. And this is her home community in Minnesota. <laughs> and, you know, she's part of the Hmong community, yeah. which is um, an ethnic minority community from Southeast Asia. Many of them came over after the Vietnam War. They are mm. super tight knit and incredibly proud. She, Suni Lee doesn't just represent her country. She represents her people. And they are enormously proud that one of their own is in the Olympics for the first time. The looming question, as you mentioned, is whether or not Simone Biles is actually going to compete in the individual events that are coming up. She posted two videos on Instagram this morning that seemed to suggest she will not. She said mm. she's still having troubles. One of them is her dismounting off the uneven bars and landing flat on her back. Mm. Biles says she's still suffering from what gymnasts call the twisties, which sounds like a cute name, but is actually really dangerous. Mm -hmm. Gymnasts lose their sense of where they are in the air and their landing gets confused and they can really hurt themselves. So it appears like she's still suffering from that. Those videos were later taken down off of her Instagram page. I'm not sure why, but we're trying to get to the bottom of that. Still no decision made for her. Guys, That's, we could talk about gymnastics all day. I know. But also, is anybody, am I the only one who starts crying every time we see those videos of the oh, families? No. It makes me tear up. It's the sweetest thing. When you hear <laughs> Suni Lee's family talking, her dad talking, absolutely. And Suni talking about how she shares this gold medal with everyone, her coach who doesn't get a medal. I mean, it was very, yeah, very emotional. Absolutely. Also, though, a very big day for the U.S. swim team, Steph. They're bringing home more medals, but this is drama. Yeah. One star swimmer now saying he's not sure his race was clean. You have to get us caught up there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Ryan Murphy swam the 200-meter backstroke, and you have to know, up until this Olympics, the Team USA owned the backstroke. Mm. Uh, he got the silver, and during the press conference following the event, he said he didn't think the race was clean. Now, keep in mind, he's sitting about four feet away from the guy who won it, mm. who's part of the Russian Olympic Committee. And we know that they're called the Russian Olympic Committee here instead of just Russia because of the doping scandals in the past. Now, when when the Russian swimmer was asked pointedly whether or not um, you know, the allegation was true. He said, listen, I've gone through every single test possible to be here. Uh, I, I'm clean. The race was clean. But it was quite a thing to say and to, to drop in, in that moment. Mm. But, you know, Team USA continues to, to really dominate in the pool, two silvers and a bronze today and, and a lot to cheer about for them. And there's more to come. Steph, I also mentioned just a second ago, another major event. Just quickly tell us track and fields getting underway. What should we watch for there? Oh yeah, it, it's gonna it's gonna be really exciting. I, you know, for for me, I have to say I love Allison Felix. This is her fifth Olympics. She's won six gold medals. She's going for another one. Uh, she's a mom. I mean, and she's super <laughs> fast still. <laughs> and, and it's going to be really fun to watch a race. But there are a lot of Americans who, who we have high hopes um, on. Usain Bolt is out of the, is, is no longer running. So that opens up the fastest man in the world uh, possibility. And so, you know, all eyes will be on that. That hasn't even started. Well, it started today. And, it, and that's going to really be the highlight in the coming days, guys. Yeah, absolutely. Gosh, so much to keep watching for, Steph. Thank you for getting us caught up. We will see you in a bit. Enjoy while you're there. Gold medal for Stephanie with all that yeah. great coverage. Yeah. <laughs> all right, we're going to turn now to severe weather. It ripped through parts of the Pennsylvania and New Jersey overnight. At least five people were hurt after a tornado went through Bucks County, Pennsylvania. It caused, look at, take a look, caused widespread damage oh, wow. there. You can see buildings were torn apart, yep. some homes and even a car dealership just ripped apart there. Mm. The National Weather Service yeah. confirmed this was a tornado and that's what's to blame for all that devastation you're looking at. And so now for more on that and a check on your morning news now weather, what we can expect heading into the weekend. Bill Karens is here. Hey, Bill. Hey, good morning. Yes, yeah, scary times. I mean, we don't get a lot of tornadoes like that in the Pennsylvania, New Jersey border area. And this one, we had two that were on the ground for apparently a while. It was amazing we didn't have more injuries and more problems than what you just saw. Um, five injuries is bad enough, but it could have been so much worse uh, as those, those tornadoes went through pretty populated areas. So right now, the, the storm threat is shifting from the northeast yesterday back to the plains as we'll track our next storm over the weekend. The northeast has cleared out, for the most part, a few showers left around, around Albany, New York this morning. So a slight risk of severe storms today. I think maybe some damaging wind. I don't think we're going to see too many problems with hail or tornadoes today but watch out our friends right around omaha and then heading down into northern missouri as we go throughout the evening and how about this we love any wet weather we can get in the west we've had a lot of rain lately in arizona that's fantastic it's actually helping 
to dent the drought a little bit. And we'll take the rain today. Flash flood watches. Of course, we don't want any problems with flash flooding or things like that, but we do want the wet weather. Colorado, especially in the mountainous areas, is going to get significant rainfall over the next three days. Anywhere you see in yellow could get up to an inch of rain. And firefighters are loving this in Idaho and portions of Oregon and even Montana, too. They'll take every drop of rain they can get after this horrific start to the fire season. So for today's forecast, doesn't get any better than this in the northeast. Lower humidity, temperatures in the 80s, enjoy that. But it is still downright hot and sultry from middle of the country, from Kansas and Oklahoma and Texas, all the way through the south. And look at New Orleans today, 100 degrees. The heat index will feel like 110. And let's take you through your weekend forecast. Saturday, still holding on to fantastic weather on the eastern seaboard. A little warmer than you'd like down in the Carolinas. There's some rain likely in areas of uh, near St. Louis and also Illinois. And then by the time we get to Sunday, that storm system will make its way to the east coast for some afternoon storms. So um, after comparing what we dealt with yesterday in the northeast, yeah. I have two fantastic days in a row for you. So I don't want any complaints this time around. We wouldn't dare, Bill. That's coming from Bill, by the way. <laughs> I, I'm not going right. to, uh, you know, I don't know. All right, Bill. Thank you so much. We'll see you in a bit. Coming up, the first group of Afghan refugees who helped the U.S. military arrive in America. Where they are headed and what is in store for them. That's all next. Welcome back. There's a lot to cover in Washington as lawmakers tackle a number of major issues. First, the battle for voting rights is going to the White House today with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer set to meet with President Biden. Meanwhile, Senate Democrats are currently crafting more targeted voting rights bills. And then, of course, we've got infrastructure. While work on those two separate bills has hit a snag, Democratic Senator Kirsten Sinema says she doesn't support the $3.5 trillion human infrastructure bill the Democrats hope to pass through the reconciliation process, and they'd need her support. House progressives are pushing back on that, even threatening the bipartisan bill. And finally, last night, Congress came together, nearly unanimously passing a capital security funding bill. Every member of the Senate voted in favor of the bill. Eleven House members voted against it. Police on the Hill were on the verge of running out of money to protect the Capitol. There is obviously a lot to get to this morning, so let's go to NBC News correspondent Leanne Caldwell. Leanne, first, let's start with those voting right bills. How far have they moved in the past few weeks? How much more do they have to go? Catch us up. Sure. Good morning, Savannah. So these voting rights legislation bills were stuck in the Senate because last month they couldn't pass with the majority that they are the Republicans they needed in order for this to pass. So we thought that they were dead. But there's a brand new push to move voting rights legislation through the Senate and the House. And these would be much more scaled back voting rights components, focusing specifically just on voting access, not things like campaign finance and this other comprehensive component of uh, of legislation that the Senate and the House wanted. But um, it's still going to be very difficult. But Senator Raphael Warnock of Georgia, he is committed to making sure something passes. Let's listen to what he has to say. Passing voting rights, in my view, is the most important thing we can do this Congress. Now, I know that there are a lot of pressing issues, but uh, the American House is the house built by democracy. And if we don't preserve our democracy, strengthen people's access to it, uh, we will not have done our job. So he thinks this is just as important as infrastructure. The question, of course, remains Savannah. Where are the 10 Republicans in the Senate? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Now to infrastructure, progressive and moderate Democrats are at odds over the two bills working through Congress. So this is, of course, an issue within the party, never mind the bipartisan yeah. bill that we've got going on. How big of a divide is there within the Democratic Party? Is it growing? Could we see things get better? What's happening right now is that this bipartisan bill has a real chance of passing the 3.5 trillion reconciliation human infrastructure bill also has some movement. So everyone is laying their stakes in the ground, putting out their demands, and this is when things get messy. Uh, Kristen, Kirsten Cinema said that she doesn't like $3.5 trillion for the reconciliation bill. Well, progressives are not happy with what she had to say. Let's listen to what Ilhan Omar uh, said last night. 
we are willing to negotiate the amount of investment that goes into these priorities, but we're not willing to negotiate having these priorities not be included in the legislation that passes. So we're still at the beginning of the process, Savannah, and to see how many days in a row we can use infrastructure puns is a rocky road ahead. <laughs> yeah, really. We love them here. Keep them coming. All right. And Leanne, finally, we mentioned that capital security spending bill that passed last night. I think when you hear the word unanimous, anything these days, some ears perk up. So tell us a little bit about this and also the fact that it provides money to help Afghan refugees in the wake of U.S. withdrawing troops. What will this legislation pay for exactly? Tell us about it. Yeah, so this is in the aftermath of January 6th. Most of this legislation is about $2 billion, and um, it would uh, it would um, reinforce security at the Capitol, invest in Capitol Police, and specifically pay for all the overtime that Capitol Police mm. officers are having to use in the aftermath of January 6th. They have been working so hard. There's also mm. a component of this bill to ensure that the transfer of Afghan interpreters and people who helped the United States in the war in Afghanistan can safely repatriate to the United States, something that is a high priority for Congress and the administration, as we've seen the first group arrived this morning, Vanna. And what a time for this funding to come out as we have heard some firsthand harrowing accounts of January 6th this week. Leanne Caldwell, thank yep. you so much. More now on those Afghan refugees. This morning, a plane carrying more than 200 Afghan interpreters and others who worked with U.S. military forces has landed in Virginia. These Afghans now on their way to a new life in America. NBC News Pentagon and national security correspondent Courtney Cuby joins us now. Good morning, Courtney. What an incredible journey. And many of these people were critical to the U.S. military effort, Courtney, over the past 20 years in Afghanistan. Tell us more about this group. Oh, I think we may not. Uh, yeah, that's oh, right, Vicki. I'm sorry. I, I think I just lost my audio with you, but I can tell you a little bit about what we saw here uh, this morning. A group of uh, just over 200 Afghans arrived at Dulles Airport early this morning. Uh, they're sending them now down to Fort Lee, which is just outside of Richmond, Virginia, where they'll keep them for about a week. Uh, at that time, these these men and women... Uh, many of whom served as interpreters and their families, working with the U.S. military and the State Department in Afghanistan for years. Uh, they'll spend the next seven days or so getting acclimated to the U.S. They will go through a series of medical checks uh, before they are then uh, sent out to other parts of the country. And, and that's where it becomes a little bit more murky about where they will go. In some cases, they have family and friends here where they will go to. In other cases, uh, the U.S. will actually help resettle them in areas where they have what senior uh, White House and, and administration officials tell us is the capacity to send them. Uh, now, this is just the first of hundreds, if not thousands, who we will see come back here to the U.S. This 200 is, uh, there are 700 actually, who have gone through the entire, entire special immigrant visa process. Uh, when they and their families move here, it'll be about 2,500 total over the course of the next several weeks. But that's actually just the beginning. There are at least 4,000 to upwards of 20,000 more Afghans who may come to the U.S. eventually under that special immigrant visa process. Now, these others are not as far along as this first group. Many of them have, are in the very earlier stages of their visa application process. And because that, they will initially be sent to other places overseas while they go through the weeks, if not months, of the processing. But again, Vicki, so these first 200, they came in overnight. We will see more plane loads like this coming from Kabul in the days ahead with ultimately upwards of 2,500 of them being sent to Fort Lee, a U.S. military base in Virginia, uh, as their initial stop here in the United States. Courtney QB, thank you so much. And as President Biden called this first flight an important milestone as we continue to fulfill our promise to the Afghan nationals. All right, we're going to take a look at what else is making news around the world this morning. With NBC News reporter Matt Bodner. Hi, Matt. Good morning. Good morning, guys. Well, We'll start things off in space. Russia last night finally docked this very troubled space station module, Nauka, to the International Space Station. But even then, it was too soon to, to breathe a sigh of relief. A few hours after docking, uh, the module's thrusters started firing, knocking the station off of its course, spinning it 45 degrees before uh, they managed to shut the engines off. We've also seen reports that it actually just used up all of its fuel. 
The good news is uh, there was no damage to the station. More important, uh, the crew is fine, but NASA did have to cancel a planned launch today uh, of the new Boeing crew vehicle uh, while they sort all of this out. Moving along now to the Arabian Sea, the UK's Ministry of Defense says that an Israeli flagged uh, a merchant ship came under attack off the coast of Oman uh, today, but they haven't really offered very much more in the way of details. There have been a number of similar attacks like this over the past few months amid tensions with Iran, uh, but Israel on this attack has not actually commented itself, so we'll keep an eye on this one. And then finally, Shakira has some tax problems in Spain. Uh, yesterday, a Spanish judge ruled that there's enough evidence to try her on charges of tax fraud. Spain is alleging that Shakira failed to pay $17 million in taxes between 2012 and 2014, but her lawyers say, say that she uh, did not reside there until 2015 and that they're confident uh, that she did nothing wrong. I can confirm $17 million is a lot of money. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> All right, well, that's something to watch for. All right, Matt, thank you so much. <laughs> and now coming up tomorrow, the federal eviction moratorium ends and then thousands of renters around the country could receive eviction notices. Yeah, how people are preparing as many are still dealing with the economic impact of the pandemic. That's next. Well, after more than a year, most Broadway shows are finally preparing to turn their lights back on. But with some new safety protocols in place, the Broadway League and Equity, that's the Actors Union, have released an outline of some of the new requirements to keep everyone safe. All employees will have to be fully vaccinated. There will be additional sick pay for any actor or stage manager that gets COVID, plus weekly testing at no cost. Unfortunately, no meet and greets back or backstage tours for the time being. They say there is an evolving discussion right now about these reopening plans, especially as COVID cases continue to rise. But you know what, Savannah, let's keep our fingers crossed that Broadway yeah. is coming back. Such a vital part of New York City. I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. It's just like we were talking about the Olympics. It's something that we just all need to be able to do some of that stuff if we can do so safely. And good to hear about the sick pay for the employees. Absolutely. Yeah, they're taking care of the very important people. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Vicky. Yeah. Now, millions of Americans could soon be forced to move out of their homes as a nationwide eviction ban is set to expire tomorrow. NBC News political reporter Von Hilliard joins us from Atlanta with more on what it all means. Von, good morning. So first, something to note here, the White House says its hands are tied, saying it's on the Supreme Court that the eviction moratorium is ending. But put this in context for us. What's going on here? How big of an impact could we see from all this beginning tomorrow? Yeah, good morning, Savannah. Exactly. You see that statement there put out by the White House. This is sort of a Hail Mary move here with just two days until the eviction moratorium comes to an end. That is tomorrow, July 31st. And you can see in that statement, they note that the Supreme Court one month ago, we should note, decided on a five to four vote that the CDC was no longer able to extend the eviction moratorium for folks. Well, that's where they're calling on Congress here at the last minute to be the ones to extend it. Now, up on Capitol Hill, from uh, uh, on background from a senior House Democratic official. They said that they are looking to whip up the votes and seeing if they could pass such an extension. But the reality is it's very unlikely to pass here by tomorrow's end date here. And what does this mean? We're talking about up to 3.6 million or more individuals who the census says uh, are expecting to not be able to pay their rent in the next two month, in, months and face eviction. What you have had over the last 11 months is the CDC, because of the pandemic, extend uh, 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 rent relief to tenants. But what you are seeing now is folks suddenly backlogged and now they are literally receiving at their homes this week those very eviction notices that could put them out of their homes. And let's, what did you hear from some of these families? I know you spoke to some of them who are dealing with that. What are, what's going to happen? What are they telling you? The big issue here is that there were billions of dollars in federal relief, uh, Savannah, that were passed through the relief packages in Congress over the last year. But just a fraction of that actual money has made it 
to tenants and landlords. Here in Georgia, just five and a half percent of the federal funds designated to go help renters that are facing eviction has not made it to the renters, a large part because it's been tied up in the paperwork and the difficult qualifications and basic access to those funds. I want to let you hear from one of those uh, women, Sierra Green. She's a mom of three, and we sat down with her yesterday just after she appeared for her eviction hearing for the first time. She could be booted. She could be moved out and evicted from her home at any moment. They are hoping and waiting for those federal funds to come through. Her landlord, she's lucky, is providing some leniency while we, they wait for those funds, but take a listen to part of our conversation. Where would you go? I don't know. <laughs> just to be honest, um... I mean, only option is a hotel because it's going to be hard trying to get into a new apartment due to all the qualifications you have to have and having the eviction open, you know, they will judge you for that. What you just heard from Sierra is essentially saying in order to make and be approved to go to another apartment, mm -hmm. they go and do the background search and they can go and see just because she now has already had an eviction notice filed against her. Hasn't been evicted yet, but a eviction notice filed against her. That is on her public record and the difficulty in getting in a future apartment to then go and accept your, right. uh, your qualification papers in order to be there. It's that much difficult. We should note, Sierra, she was working two jobs until earlier this year. She lost one of her jobs at a warehouse uh, because of the pandemic. And she said that her rent at the same time went up from $900 to $1,300. She said that is why she is behind on her payments. She doesn't have enough money to cut the rent that is due. She doesn't know what is next year in the days ahead. Mm -hmm. Vaughn, it's heartbreaking to hear those personal stories and, of course, of families, people with children. And also, you bring up a really smart point, though, about a lot of these landlords are also just small business owners, and they're mm -hmm. struggling because that payment has been tied up in, as you so well put it, the paperwork that would be helping them. That's why these notices are coming out. Vaughn, thank you so much. Great reporting. Today, demonstrators will complete the final leg of their march for voting rights. It has been a long journey under the Texas summer sun. Marchers with the Poor People's Campaign have just 10 miles to go on their 27-mile pilgrimage to the Texas state capitol in Austin. State and federal lawmakers are under pressure to strengthen voting rights. Organizers of the march are frustrated the Senate can vote on infrastructure in a bipartisan way, but not on ballot access. Here is Reverend Dr. William Barber speaking yesterday. 17 Republicans joined Democrats on a bipartisan uh, procedural vote for a trillion dollar infrastructure, but we can't get a vote on the infrastructure of a democracy. Now, what's the difference? Money. Demonstrations also taking place on Capitol Hill. Representative Sheila Jackson Lee became the third member of the Congressional Black Caucus to be arrested for protesting for voting rights in Washington, D.C. This follows CBC Chairwoman Joyce Beatty and Congressman Hank Johnson. NBC News Now correspondent Priscilla Thompson joins us now from the North Austin Muslim Community Center, where she's been following this march since the start. Priscilla, national voting rights legislation is limping through Congress, facing a tough battle in the Senate. How hopeful are organizers that their work is going to help get these bills to the president's desk? Well, Vicki, good morning. That's right. We reported this week that senators are working on revised voting legislation and that Senator Schumer has said he would like to make progress on that before the Senate recesses at the end of next week. And that news, of course, came as marchers here were in the middle of this 27 mile uh, march. And we heard Reverend William Barber say that uh, their efforts here have certainly had an impact. Take a listen. Before we all started marching, they said it was going to be after the session, like when they came back. Then they saw Rabbi Ed over and they saw you and all y'all put on these shoes and started walking. And now they're talking about the field and they're talking about adding things back in. Don't ever underestimate the power of marching around Jericho. If you will stay there long enough, the walls will begin to crumble. 
And you heard those cheers, of course, when he said that. Folks here are certainly in high spirits as they finish out with these uh, 10 miles today. It'll be the most miles that they have done on any given day so far. Vicki? And Priscilla, we know Stacey Abrams, the Clintons, also joining in this effort. What are the marchers saying about potential progress on Capitol Hill to move voting rights federal legislation through Congress? Well, marchers here are certainly uh, excited to see that uh, lawmakers in D.C. appear to be making this more of a priority and particularly an urgent priority to get something done before uh, that August recess. But they are also not letting up the pressure on those lawmakers who they are calling to act. Take a listen to what some of the marchers that I spoke with had to say. We are going to be out here and we're going to march wherever we are across this country, but particularly here in Texas, that we're not going to stand for it if they don't pass some kind of reform to make sure that voting rights are accessible to all voters in the state of Texas and across the country. I'm very upset with President Biden because I feel like he's not advocating for us in this moment. Um, and it, and it, what I want him to see is, is to stop saying to out-organize voter suppression. I want him to, to support the elimination of the filibuster. I want him to support and endorse the For the People Act because he needs to step up to, to, step up to the plate. And most folks here are still calling for the passage of that For the People Act. It's unclear what this uh, revised legislation could have in it or would have in it and whether or not that would appease the folks who are on the ground calling for this change. Vicki? Priscilla Thompson, thank you so much. Coming up, more companies are mandating their workers get the COVID-19 vaccine. The new names joining the list and how it's impacting their employees and their business. That's coming up after the break. As the number of COVID cases rise across the country, companies are starting to require vaccines and pushing back returning to the workplace plans. NBC News senior business correspondent Stephanie Rule has more. Hey there, Vicki and Savannah. As this pandemic spreads, we're now seeing a number of companies step up and start mandating vaccinations for employees and in some cases customers. And others are delaying their return to work date. Add Uber to the fast-growing list. The ride-hailing giant now making vaccinations mandatory for U.S. employees coming to the office and delaying their global return to office by a month. Employees are really responding to and reacting to colleagues in the workplace saying, I want you to provide as reasonably safe of a workplace as you can. Uber joins Netflix, Google, Facebook, Morgan Stanley, Lyft, United, The Washington Post, and Saks Fifth Avenue, all requiring vaccines for at least some employees. And even the NFL, which doesn't mandate vaccines, says it will hold teams financially responsible if a COVID case cancels a game. I wouldn't have gotten the vaccine if, uh, without the protocols that they're enforcing on us. Restaurateur Danny Meyer going a step further. Beginning the day after Labor Day, we are going to require that 100 percent of our staff members be vaccinated and that any guest who wants to dine indoors will be vaccinated as well. How are you going to handle customers that challenge this? Yes, the same way we would challenge somebody who, who refused to show their ID if they were underage at a bar. We just won't serve them. He says he'll look for proof via a CDC vaccination card or digital passport. For companies who are dealing with employees who say they're afraid, afraid to come back to work, is mandating vaccines the clearest way to sort of help people who have those concerns? A mandate that explains to the employee why it's likely in their best interest as well as the best interest of their colleagues uh, will go a long way. Other companies are now postponing their return to work. Lyft delaying six months to February. Apple and Google pushing back their date. And Twitter closing its New York and San Francisco offices due to the surge in cases. Vicki, Savannah? All right. Thank you, Stephanie. Roll coming up a look inside the busiest air traffic control tower in the world as we exclusively reveal the FAA's new major hiring campaign. If you play video games, they are looking for you. We'll tell you more after the break. Looking forward to this one, Savannah. <laughs> Savannah. 
The Biden administration is shifting into high gear, planning to boost mileage and pollution standards for cars and trucks over the next five years. The new tailpipe requirements are expected to be announced by the EPA and the Transit Transport Department next week. NBC News correspondent Josh Leiterman joins us now with more on this. And Josh, explain to us more about these plans. What do they look like over the next five years? Well, it's been tough for the Biden administration to figure out how to structure this because a lot of time was lost during the Trump administration when those tailpipe standards were actually rolled back. And so what the Biden administration has decided to do is leave things basically how they are for model year 2022, because those cars are already in production, will be sold as early uh, as this year. But starting next year, which is technically model year 2023, uh, those cars are going to have to face uh, the more strict standards that have been in place in California under a deal that automakers reached with the state of California that requires about a 3.7 increase in fuel economy uh, as well as emissions reductions uh, per year. So that'll be 2023, 2024. And then starting in 2025, the Biden administration, according to two sources uh, familiar with the plan who spoke to NBC News, they will then require the automakers to go back to the Obama era standards, which required about at a 5% increase per year. And by 2026, the Biden administration uh, intends to have those standards be even more stringent than how it was under Obama. But of course, we lost a couple of years, so the net effect could be a little bit less. But the Biden administration hoping to get us back into an aggressive pace of reducing our pollution from tailpipes and transportation, which is the biggest source of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. So what are climate activists saying about these targets? Do they think they go far enough to curb greenhouse emissions? You know, they don't. And one of the things they say is, look, the automakers are already essentially complying with this because they struck that deal with California, which is such a big market for vehicles. So they say we shouldn't be putting out rules that essentially just say, good job. You know, you're good with the levels that you have now. They want rules that will force the automakers uh, to go even farther. Uh, but at the same time, you know, part of this is about how much flexibility do you give to companies as they're also trying to shift towards electric vehicles and put a lot of resources resources into that as well. And a lot of incentives for people to buy those cars. Josh, what are you hearing from car makers and right. industry about these new rules? Well, they haven't wanted to comment very openly yet because these new rules have actually not been formally announced. They were described to us by sources briefed on them, but the Biden administration expected to roll them out formally probably early next week. But so far, what we ha we do know is that major automakers such as General Motors, they've been lobbying the Biden administration for months now uh, to say these standards give them a little bit of a break for now. Their argument has been that if they ha can have a little bit more flexibility now, they can take all of those research dollars and put them into developing new electric vehicles as well as driving down the cost of electric vehicles so that by 2035, when GM says they're going to phase out electric vehicles, America can go much farther towards electric vehicles, cutting those greenhouse gas emissions. All right, Josh, thanks so much. All right, the FAA is hiring, really hiring, looking to fill thousands of air traffic control positions. And it might surprise you who they are targeting with this new campaign. I got an exclusive look inside a tower in the busiest airspace in the world to hear more about the FAA's game plan and the high stakes jobs that keep our skies safe. So when I'm sitting on an airplane and they're like, we're being held by air traffic control, that's coming from here. <laughs> Not exactly. <laughs> Something kind of like that. Not exactly. <laughs> Danielle Sheffield works at LaGuardia's air traffic control tower in New York City. This airport has the busiest airspace in the world. She gave us an exclusive look inside. At any point in time, when we're busy, there could be 50 to 60 pilots on the radio and there's only one of you. All those buttons and screens might remind you of some kind of high stakes arcade, which is why the FAA is hoping to recruit more people like this. Marcus Bryce is a supervisor at Joint Base Andrews, keeping the skies safe for Air Force One. He's also a big gamer. How often do you call on the same skills that you would use for a video game? Very often. You've got to pay attention to the map. You're constantly scanning and watching what's going on. You're memorizing uh, maps and locations like they do in certain games. 
The FAA's new hiring campaigns targeting young, diverse candidates with the hand-eye coordination and spatial skills you might find in gamers. It is, it's so tactical that when we're up there in this tower, we're talking to each other, we're coordinating with, with each other, we're coordinating with other facilities at the same time to make these moves happen. The fun of, of playing a video game is also in the work of doing air traffic controlling. Anyone 18 to 30 can apply during their open enrollment period. This is the first time that they're specifically asking for people with gaming skills. It totally makes sense. I can definitely see how those skills would correlate between gaming and air traffic control. When he tells him clear for takeoff, you will then see Delta begin to roll. I used uh, the football game Madden yeah. to, to enhance my skills to work uh, the radar position that I was working. Do you know how many controllers you're looking to hire? Yeah, they're looking for 4,300 in the next five years. That's a big number. Yeah, we need a lot. There's a lot of people, because you have to retire at 56, there's a lot of people that have to retire. So that older generation is moving on and we need a newer generation to take up the slack. To be a federal controller, you have to be fully trained and receive a job offer by 31. So with a few weeks till my 30th birthday, I tested out the job using a simulator. Him right here that landed. Oh, uh-huh. You say oh. American 742, turn left at Charlie, join Bravo, contact ground. Oh, that was a lot. American 742, turn, he already knows what he's doing. <laughs> I missed it. I'm bad at this. You miss it. I may not be the best candidate here, but someone like Nathan Swickert might be. Yeah, I think I have the skills of gaming anyways that the FAA is looking for. The fast reflexes and communication skills, it's something I've done all my life. He's currently finishing up high school, but hopes to apply in a few years. I could see myself in the future, like talking to pilots, talking them through landing strategies and taxiing them off the runways. I think it would definitely compare to playing video games for sure. Much higher stakes. <laughs> <laughs> and that new hiring campaign, it's actually starting right now through Monday. They rarely do this where they do this open enrollment period, but they're really looking for young people, as you heard in there, because they have so many people about to retire. And very specific requirements, too, which yeah. is so interesting to see how gaming translates directly to air traffic control. That, it's fantastic. I know, right? Isn't Great spotlight. It, even if it's the month of your 31st birthday, yeah. you can't accept a job because they want you to have 25 years in the career. And it's a congressional mandate that you retire at the age of 56 to keep those skills sharp. Any idea what the pay is? No, actually, they gave us a little bit of information about that, but it's also on their website. Yeah. Okay, terrific. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah, that does it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Hey, NBC News viewers. Thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.